Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Welcome to another episode of the Talent Equation. Um, got a got a very. Um, I'm excited about this next conversation because I've managed to find. I managed to be able to pin down uh, the uh, the world famous Russell Earnshaw. Um, who has managed to find uh, an hour or two in his schedule where he's not driving from one end of the country to the other or sending thousands of emails. Uh, Rusty, good to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. And that was £10 well spent on your intro music. I enjoyed that a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, Radio J, I'm indebted to him. Uh, so big, big shout out to him because uh, he does a great job. And if anybody wants any uh, voiceover done, then he's the man. Um, hey, Rusty, um like I said, it's been a while getting us on because, you know, our schedules haven't made it happen. I'm really glad we can have this conversation. Um, lots of stuff to talk about. We can go in all sorts of different directions. I think the starting point for me, um, and and we just said this before we even started recording, was you just you just used a phrase which I think I'd like to, to use as a starting point, which was about not putting the software of today on the kids' hardware. What do you mean by that? Uh well, it's interesting. One of the first questions I often ask uh, ex-players is, um, what position did you play? Uh, if you were a back, did you go into a forwards meeting? If so, how often? Um, and so we got a generation of players who uh, the backs never went into forwards meetings or the high numbers never went into the low numbers meetings and vice versa. And so we had this. We'd already divided the team up. So um, I'm, I'm I'm always a little bit confused by that. Uh, I think the difference between us and the best team in the world is the fact that they are connected up and it's difficult to tell who their low numbers and their high numbers are. Uh, and so if we continue to coach as we have done, and that would be a, a glaring example for me, having half the team in a meeting and often the guy with a with a 10 on his back, not in that meeting, uh, and he's possibly in charge of running the game, then we're not going to allow these kids to achieve their potential. So I think we should be, you know, talking about anticipation and deception and awareness a bit more and understanding that if I'm playing with you, Stuart, I need to understand what it, what it is that you're good at uh, and how I can best support you and what, what are the areas that I might need to help her support you with. Uh, I think we need to think of players as coaches, uh, not as players. It would definitely be easier if we had 30 coaches on the pitch. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking that perhaps the game of the future is going to look significantly different to the to the game as it does now, um, and, and maybe just the the people you know the, we talk a lot about the All Blacks and certainly we'd want to be ahead of them, not following them. Uh, however, some of the stuff they're doing in the game at the moment, the way they're they're not kicking for goals and the way they're playing, they're just exploring the game. Um, we got um, to start thinking like an excited that, puppy. Like. I've just jumped straight into talking about um, all this kind of stuff. But what I neglected to do uh, is actually get you to uh, kind of talk a little bit about um, what you do and kind of where you've come from and what your backstory is. Because I think a lot of people out there may know you and they'll know that you're talking about rugby because that's sort of your day to day. But a lot of people might not. So it might just be worth having that as a starting point And then we can come back to what you just said. <laughs> I imagine lots of people are hurriedly Googling me thinking, who is this imposter? Um, uh, I, yeah, so I work at RFU. I <clears throat> coach in the pathway uh, with England 18s, uh, and I support coaches in the in that pathway as well and, and a little bit beyond. Um, my backstory is uh, I was at school. I watched the varsity match. I thought that looks quite cool. I'd like to play in that. Decided to work quite hard in my A-levels. Uh, went to Cambridge. 
uh, played a bit of rugby there. Um, <clears throat> probably the, the, my favourite rugby ever, to be honest. I often talk about Tony Rogers as the guy who was more concerned with the golf ball and the peg and the drinking game, so we coached ourselves. Um, and it turned out pretty well. We had some uh, fun times and, and some, you know, with some really nice performances. Uh, I then went and played professional rugby. Um, I possibly felt pretty constrained by professional rugby, if I'm honest. Uh, coached, coached in England sevens with uh, with Ben Ryan a bit. Uh, took two years out, uh, became a teacher. Um, uh, taught economics for two years, which is cool. It's great fun. Uh, and then uh, came back in. This job came up. It's my dream job. So I've been doing that for the last two and a half years. I get to work with some uh, some great people and. And more importantly, some some pretty ex- exciting young players. So, who, uh, yeah, just you're right at the cold r- place, Awesome it? to coach them, and you're working really, so you know, closely with yeah, right a lot of coaches. Place. What are the challenges that you're seeing emerging within coaches that you work with on a, on a daily basis? Um, yeah, it's uh, well, it's a lot of coaches. There's one challenge, uh, a real large number uh, of. People who possibly don't know what they don't know, but actually once they, I, I think we were talking earlier, I, we had one coach come in and he said, it's like I've seen fire for the first time. Uh, so I think our, our job really is to spark their curiosity. Uh, I think well, once we've got that, I mean, you would struggle to find many coaches that don't have good intentions. Uh, in the same way you would struggle to find many parents that don't have good intentions. So I, I think our role is supporting those guys uh, and girls, uh, the um, I guess one of the challenges is that there's large numbers. So what we're trying to do is create much more coaching communities where people can share and learn off each other and observe and go into each other's environments. Uh, the Magic Academy, so our online stuff, has, uh, has been pretty popular. We've got about 1,300 coaches on there from Premiership down, so that's kind of helped solve that. Um, we've set up academy development officers in each club, although I would like to call them academy coaching wizards. Apparently that's not, it's not allowed. Uh, but yeah, just trying to get people who are wizards in different areas that can, you know, influence other people. So it's pretty challenging to, to, to say, well, we've got four or five people and we're going to influence everyone. We're just trying to create more and more wizards. Um, what are the challenges? Uh, yeah, competition. The per- perception that you need to win games, often not the case. Um, ego. So we would have, you know, we would interact with, not not really at, with too many of the coaches that, that we're working with, but people who it's about them and it's not about the kids. So, so uh, in terms of helping those guys ranked, as well is always a great challenge. One. Um, one of the main ways in which a coach can be demarked as um, you know, successful or a good coach is their record. You know, generally speaking, coaches who are getting appointed into different roles, like, you know, uh, become head coach of a club, or whatever, they get appointed because they've had a win, they've had a promotion or a series of promotions. So, of course, the idea of winning being associated with good coaching is pretty wrapped up. But in a talent development context, often it's the opposite. So for me, for well, what do you think kind of are the characteristics or what what sort of earmarks somebody for you as being a potential wizard? Um, it's a great question. I mean, I... Uh... And we could we could talk all day about what we mean by winning. Um, we, you know, our best coaches would be they would be curious, they'd be very self aware, uh, they would be willing to, to try stuff and and fail and get it wrong, and be willing to be vulnerable in front of their players. So uh, they think individually, they think longitudinally. Uh, they're not constrained by a result at the weekend. They see it as a often as a, 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 a just another training session, another opportunity to learn. And I think you're right. I mean, often we will – one of our challenges is a lot of our kids win a lot of games. So if you're in an environment where you win all the time and, and 
we had one example of a kid who'd won 120 fixtures on the bounce. Well, that's not a particularly good development environment for him because, well, uh, the learning pit that followed the uh, the, the losses uh, was fairly significant. So actually having those deliberate bumps, having the deliberate challenges, starting better players on the bench, playing them in different positions, setting them challenges within games so that they're playing games within games uh, are all solutions to, yeah, that I think a lot of people are obsessed with winning. Um, I was with a guy the other day, Richard Shorter, who uh, works with parents, and he just said, you know, your your, your questions uh, demonstrate your values. And so I always tell my mum off, first question, did you win? Second question, did you score? Third question, did you get man of the match? That's what she thinks is important. Uh, is you know if 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 I said to her, look, would you, um, you've would you prefer there, which is about results winning or character real, from your grandson? Where, I know which one um, you want. You know, environmentally, you know, we're very results driven. Um, you know, media is very results driven. Uh, you know, when it comes to the way we fund sport, it's always about results. So. Um, you know, even in a participation space, you know, there's results in terms of like, you know, numbers of participants in the elite space. It's about medals or it's about trophies and all these sorts of things. So we've become when it comes to sport, we've become very results focused. And whenever you have a conversation with somebody and you talk about the potential downsides of competition from a player development perspective, often you get met with um, some pretty vociferous responses um, in terms of people saying things like, well, you you know, you're just anti-competition. Um, you know, you're, you're kind of watering it down. Or you're, you're basically a tree hugger. So, I mean, how do you navigate some of that? How do you help coaches to kind of um, stay resilient in the face of what can be some fairly overwhelming cultural challenges? Yeah, and look, and the reality is the same. A lot of these kids that we're working with in their schools, it's exactly the same. So if you look on their Twitter feed, it gives you pretty a pretty good measure of of what's important in that school. So, and they're often talking about the five percent of the kids who are getting A stars and rocking it in sport. Um, what do I think? I think the competitiveness. Uh, our best players would all have that. They would all, you know. I think it's something you can develop. I think it's a skill. Uh, if you came into an England uh, 18s camp, you would see lots of scores being kept and people set challenges against each other. Uh, the cha- you know as well as I do, the problem with competition on a, you know, and I'm a Sunday morning dad. So when the mighty old Bristolians and the 14s rock up and, and the opposition have left 10 players at home because they want to, want to win a game, then it's, it's the adult behaviors that go around competition when we've got, Parents on sidelines giving instructions to kids, or the you know the the, the little kid uh, sat on the bench for the entirety of the game. Well, that's that's the downside of competition, and we're not playing in a league or a cup. We're just playing a game of rugby. Uh, however, yeah, it's just the adult behaviours. It's the parental behaviours that that follow on from it as well. And, and like I say, everyone has good intentions. They they possibly just don't realise. I don't want to. I mean, I'm not necessarily developing all their plans. But I'd be interested to get your views on this. I think, I think there's something about... People that find meaning in their lives, which is ultimately why we're... And I think, let, let's face it, do. I think a lot of people who come into coaching, you know, particularly, you know, like you and me, you know, Sunday morning dads, uh, we do so, you know, we're, we're generally speaking quite competitive people. And as a result, sometimes formal competitive structures can be quite seductive. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, um, He's chairman of a, a local football club and um, he's really, really keen. He wants me to come and do some work with his club because he's really keen to try and you know, build a really kind of player centred philosophy within the club and, and um, you know, really bought into the idea of kind of equal game time and this, that and the other. And I saw him socially and he was telling me about how they were playing a game um, that morning. And there was one young lad on the sideline and, um, you know, he's on the bench. And he said, right, yeah, t- you get warmed up. You're going to be coming on sort of last sort of 15 minutes. And they were losing 2-0. And then all of a sudden they scored a goal and it was 2-1. And his his coach that he works with, his kind of co-coach, said, no, no, he's not coming on now because we could draw this. So this boy didn't play any any football that day. 
and I and, and the rationale was well it's you know it's it's a league it's competition you know it's a bit more serious now they're they're a certain age and actually we've got to do it that way and I, I had a long conversation about that I'd be interested just to get your views on that Um, yeah, I'm definitely feeling sorry for that young kid. He's possibly going to fall out of love with sport pretty quickly. Uh, I mean, why would you come back? Uh, look, we've we've had it in rugby. We've had guys in our environment really who've released who recently have released kids from. They play with their mates. They rock up on a Sunday, and the coach turns around and says, "You're not good enough." I mean, that is that's blown my mind. If I'm honest, uh, I've been trying to think of it more positively. So. Last weekend we played uh, with uh, Broad Plain. I'm going to give them a shout out. So uh, I'm going to send Brendan's and Gordano and with those old Bristolians. And I gave all the coaches a nightclub clicker. Um, and the coaches got a, a point every time they gave a positive to another kid from an opposition team and they give them a reason why. They got um, five points if they could get a kid to do that to another kid. I think that's a really useful skill to have to be able to give positive feedback to other other boys. Often boys like taking the mickey out of each other. Uh, the best behaved parents got an extra 20 points on the liquor. Uh, if any parent was misbehaving and uh, and we talked about what that might look like and the coach kind of, uh, you know, went over and had a word with them, they got five points to that. And then we just played some games with the condition that if, they, if it got more than two scores apart, the coaches would even it up in some way. Uh, the kids would do their own subs anyway, and uh, each player was only allowed to score one try in one game. So, you know, the, the big kid who's often running over people, then sometimes his, you know, his players might start supporting him. And afterwards, we then pulled all the parents in and pulled the kids in and the coaches and just said to the kids, you know, what did that feel like? What was it? And they just talked about it being this brilliant atmosphere. We could try stuff. It was great fun. And uh, <laughs> well, I just used competition amongst coaches. And they were really competitive, the coaches. They wanted to get the most clicks. And I think the most clicks was, I think Gordano got, uh, so uh, Mr. Mowbray from uh, Gordano got like 220 clicks. And he's high-fiving kids and he's, you know, he's giving real uh, support to opposition players. And the parents are being super positive on the touchline because they want to get 20 points. Um, so I think we can reframe it. Um, it's tough, isn't it? Because... You know, I often have these kind of similar conversations to you on a Sunday morning, and in the background, my wife is going, "For God's sake, be a dad, not a coach." I um, um I have actually just got some. But if someone comes up to you on a Sunday um, and essentially mainly kind of just challenges your coaching or your parenting, then score of you're not going to have a positive games, reaction. So I think remember, we need but, to um, we need to reframe. I'm, I'm going to get some more because I think that's a fantastic solutions. idea, and I'm also going to take shares out in the company that makes them because I'm pretty certain that this is going to be the most popular thing on Amazon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're going the same way as headbands, apparently. Uh, and I've just been with the coaches when we've done, you know, coach evenings and just said, look, go and find creative uses for these. So John Fletcher the other day said, I got nine. It was nine really poor questions that I asked. Uh, one, one of the mums, when we were up in York, she said, I heard, uh, I got 60, 60 times I heard people laugh. Uh, someone else had 16 in the England uh, South Camp, which was, number of times that they saw players actually solving problems themselves in the moment rather than, you know, tactically, rather than an intervention from a coach. Um, so just thinking of, well, if we could objectify stuff, yeah. you know, if we could quantify that's some fantastic. some interesting stuff, it's actually quite interesting kind of equipment. You know, um, coach last equipment night was talking about, you know, every time I, I want to intervene and I don't, I'm going to give myself a click and, 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 and then I'm going to look at whether or not the players solve the problem. I mean, I'm going to give myself a click and I'm going to give myself a click and I'm going to look at whether or not the players solve the problem. I mean, how? And it's also how my daughter gets significantly better at maths. She's just learning like numbers that are in the thousands. So she's like clicking away and we'll go, oh, add 10, what number have you got? 
and she'll go click, click, click. This is how much I love you. Uh, what forty? That That's not I much. That um, I, I, I so, uh, you've done that. But it's just got a curious about numbers, and so she will walk around the house. With, it's a bit like a bad boy or something. Myself, she give a lot of points kind of out clicking and counting stuff. Like, and I give, it's um, just because it's I give fail points touch. out quite often, um, which is you know if I know a player's been working on something, you know, like a particular move or something, whatever it is they're trying to they're trying to succeed with, and they have a go at it and it doesn't work. Then you know I'll give I'll give a give a fail point out and then I'll ask the players afterwards kind of like what you know what why did I give that point and then they'll have to come back to me and say you know and try and work it out and and I did that within an environment because I had a group of kids who were really really un unprepared to um, to fail you know they either either peer pressure was such that they felt like they couldn't fail they were from an environment where failure really wasn't an option and you had to do you know kind of things in a certain way because of course, we wanted to try and get a result at the end. So I think clickers failures or things like that might be an interesting exploration. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. I mean, I often talk about, you know, and it's, and that's a really good way of framing it. We would talk about perhaps decision making. Uh, you know, was it a good decision and then separate that from execution? Google have, uh, you know, a, a full letter word beginning with F cards. Um, so if you, and if you don't use them, well, when you do your PDR annual, if you haven't used your F up cards, then they go, well, why haven't you used them? Um, and it's just a different way as you've done and you've just reframed what I would call learning. So trying stuff and exploring and uh, it's just a different way of reframing it rather than as, you know, when I ask uh, practically every kid in the country, you know, have you ever been banned yeah, by uh, a coach? I think that's something then, that we've been constrained by the French coaching have. to use it to get a bit um, technical, so I suppose. There's two, um, the, you know, one of the things I think a lot of people potentially there for you as a coach and just beginning them. to explore one is to ban them from doing two ways of doing it and the other like one is to actually support them with it and, and, yeah that's what you're doing that would way. that would kind of or make sense you to can me. reward them for a different kind of behavior they're both i think appropriate ways of um getting people to explore different decisions within a game context but um they all have, but they also have different pros and cons associated with them. And I think the restrictive approach tends to be the default people use. Like one I get all the time is like, you know, in a in a hockey context is a oh, three touch, which I'm never a huge fan of because I think that takes away a decision. The decision might be if you've got loads of space, it might be run with the ball. Um, so I, I feel like you want to, you know, you need to explore different ways of um, drawing people's attention to certain behavioral opportunities. <laughs> yeah and, and in rugby that's the kicking is the classic so if you're a low number so if you play and you, in the forwards then you've probably been told never to kick a ball and so when I speak to premiership second rowers and say how many times have you kicked a ball in your career they often say once uh, and they often say either a coach shouted at me or my players shouted at me uh, I asked someone the other day I can't remember who it was and they said Francois Pinot laughed at me so I never kicked it again. Um, and it often it's the reaction of other people. So I would often be stopping the session going, hang on. So Johnny's just kicked the ball. Was it a good decision? Yes. Was it poor execution? Yes. How's he going to get better? By practicing it. Well, Johnny, how do you feel when all your teammates laugh at you when you do it? So I'm, I'm always a bit, you know, I would talk a lot about learning environments. A good learning environment would be people would be willing to try stuff and, and, not get judgment from their peers. Uh, so for us in our world, it might be that you um, you can score a try. However, if you score through kicking, it's double points. And if you're if if it happens to be a guy with a low number that scores through kicking, then it's quadruple points. Because actually, we we almost want to amplify that because our context is we are coaching kids to play the you know to have the software of the future, and in the future, hopefully every player on the pitch will be able to kick because if everyone can kick, then it actually opens up more opportunities to pass and score because 
the opposition are going to put players in the backfield. So uh, my preference would be uh, not to take stuff away, but to, uh, yeah, to play around with scoring systems. So we might have our best kicker. So, you know, who, if, if he really does a kick to idea, score, it's it? off his in good foot. That, I mean, I think it's coming right back point. to what you, where you started there, and I think this is really, really important strong, in terms of the culture. Then is. It's, it's double so points. Just for him if, to go, well, people are really he has the opportunity trying to, to do both. And the, However, we might... You know, uh, the, we might make them aware of the fact that there's other then opportunities. They're going to um, naturally as well. uh, veer away from doing that again. Um, you know, it, it will actually probably put quite a deep-rooted um, sort of emotional response to doing something wrong that then will mean that they'll just go through like, you know, a risk aversion or a failure aversion scenario. I think that's that's really important. And what you described there, going back to what you said about Google as well, where what Google are doing is almost saying, if you're not messing up, you're not trying hard enough. And I think... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're almost like, I'm desperate for them not to work. Yeah. yeah. And what they ended up with was lots I mean, of people that's, that's, rocking uh, I mean, in the military, up and they go, well, you haven't used your cards. And they go, look, we tried to use it both, 10 times. Know, um, but they turned out to be really good Matt ideas. Matt Barker from his time within, within rugby. Oh, and so I, I see Matt quite I can often only apologise uh, for having 10 really good office, ideas. Because he's, he's working within the uh, English but Institute of Sport in, in an innovation role. You know, and he was saying to me that within the military, uh, they expect like an 80% yeah. an 80% failure rate when they're, you know, creating some sort of like you know, innovative new equipment or whatever it might be. That's that's innovation for you. You've got to have a certain number of, uh, you know, kind of unsuccessful attempts in order to genuinely push things on. But I think in the world of sport, it's completely the opposite. Uh, our expectation is, and coaching largely is driven by the idea of, of error reduction, minimise error, and therefore you'll be successful. And I just think it's a really regressive way of looking at, at coaching and human development. Yeah, and, and our version of error. So that's also part of the problem. So I've, it was interesting the other day I had a coach say to a kid, oh, that was wrong. And, uh, and, and it carried on. And then I kind of grabbed the kid and I said, oh, what are you thinking now? He said, I'm never going to try that again. So he, he just went, ultimate risk. I'm not even going to try that again. Well, then if we're talking about creating players of the future, the players uh, exploring what is possible, within the game and within themselves, then we're not doing our job correctly if we start to create that Absolutely. kind of environment. I mean, and, and people and like this James probably is Dallas a good, a good Thomas jump off Hanson point to talk about some of the stuff you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Because kind of I know I was, we wouldn't have light when I was working we within, um, How would we survive? within the RFU, um, they, you know, we, we spent quite a lot of time from, um, learn from it, working you through almost like, you know, what did we want to do in terms of developing players? And if you want a long time, there was quite a lot of back and forward and debate and discussion, as there often is in these kinds of player development rugby contexts. But the one the one thing we could kind of um, arrive on and agree on was this concept of of cards. Tell us tell us more about cards. Yeah, look, we, um, I mean, ultimately we want skillful, adaptable players who are, you know, who, and, and what we looked at around the research was uh, some of the almost like higher order skills that would help support them be world-class players. Um, and there's some other stuff as well, but this would be our five kind of key ones. And that was creativity, awareness, resilience, decision-making and self-organization. And and within each of those, we would look at how we develop those in people, both on and off the pitch, predominantly on the pitch, because ultimately that's the kind of their theatre. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's <clears throat> well, it's kind of, it's, it's helped the players understand a bit more. It's not just catch pass. It's actually lots of other stuff. So, um, 
Yeah, so I would so to look at an example, if me and you stood 10 yards away passing a ball to each other, we could possibly do it. And that, however, we might not be doing a great deal of awareness. So we, we haven't got any defenders. And so our decision on when to pass, which would be based upon a defender and a support player and and actually whether or not to pass, because there <clears throat> there might be space in the backfield, we're not actually developing that. Uh, so we, yeah, we we would a big focus would on us would be around developing these skills, uh, celebrating them, uh, and to be honest, if for the kids that and whatever it means, don't make it. I, I want the kids to love sport. I want them to keep playing the game and for as long as possible. And you know whether that's at uni, whether that's for a third team, whether that's for a, a World Cup winning England team. I can definitely sleep at night if I've if, I've, if we feel like we've we've helped them as people as well. So I do, you know, you wouldn't find many people that would argue with having kids that are creative, aware uh, of themselves it's, um, and others. It's, it's an interesting uh, one, isn't it? Resilient, I think, I, you know, I think if you're good decision makers and, and can think about this, I think one thing is so powerful. Um, Firstly, and there's it's probably very memorable resilience and self organisation. So powerful, is your starting point. I think saying, uh, quite clear the areas where we need the most attention. A lot of you know. A lot of uh, the kids um, that we interact you know, with, that would be, that would be the areas that would players be most have about. awareness and, and, and actually show resilience in the face of difficulty, you know, are, are constantly looking to make decisions. And, and also, like you say, and, and, and then in order to do that, they're obviously got to self-organise. If you prize that, that's, that's essentially the, the stuff that you're saying is what we want to do. That then challenges people who are creating environments for this kind of thing to develop. To, to operate in a very, very different way. And and I think it also requires quite a lot of um, almost like unlearning of the way they perhaps started themselves and the way they were taught and all those sorts of things. It's quite a challenge. Yeah, no. Well, yeah, and it's definitely a challenge for for lots of people. So one of our, you know, when we're looking at either adults or uh, kids coming into our environment, we're, we're often going, well, who's going to find this really hard? Who's going to find this easy? How are we going to challenge them? Who's going to find this hard? And and it is unlearning. So I've been in a couple of schools recently, and, and they would have their own version of cards on their website. They would say, we want you know, kids who are gritty, who are the leaders of the future, who are whatever it might be. Well, actually, if they stripped it back and started school again and said, well, this is our this is our output, so to say, well, it wouldn't look like it currently looks. So, however, the challenge with a school is how do you how do you admit that and, and, and do a huge amount of unlearning? Um, because the reality is if we wanted to, to develop um, resilient kids in a school, we wouldn't do a lot of the – Spoon feeding that we currently yeah. do for kids. We but wouldn't in the sports context, celebrate what winning. We might is, celebrate uh, as you have working as failing, a getting stuff wrong and learning. With, you know, we wouldn't give a test back and, and go, you got 80%. Um, percent. We would go, there's the 20% more are, you, you need know, to learn. Sort of the, so we would yes, completely reframe it. And we possibly wouldn't be sat um, what in, I, in specific what positions, in classrooms, in rows, listening to a person in front of There's a dearth of... Uh, practice, However, the dearth of um, that isn't going to change uh, awareness of of how to do this, but there's a genuine will to embrace this as a concept and to operate in this kind of way, which I think is a is a good thing from a coach development practitioner perspective. Yeah, it's really, um, I mean, look, it's, it's really had traction. Um, I think a couple of reasons. One is that, um, it actually gives coaches freedom. So often coaches feel a little bit like, well, I don't know all the technical stuff around the pass or whatever it might be, but actually it just gives them a, a little bit more freedom as well. 
Uh, and secondly, it just gives people <laughs> something to to hang their hat on. And, and I'll be honest with you, the kids loved it. We had T-shirts in uh, South Africa for you know the the players decided who'd been who'd been the most creative on the pitch in the day, or <clears throat> who'd been the most resilient, and and why. And I'm thinking these T-shirts look terrible, but the kids are loving them. I mean, they can't take them off. And at the end of the trip, they they people got to keep the t-shirts and they were really excited. And I was thinking, when are you ever going to wear that t-shirt? It's a terrible t-shirt. Um, but the kids were just loving it. Um, and it just became, you know, the, I guess just part of their language, you know, and yeah. And, and yeah, it was, it's really freed up my, my coaching. I really also think when you look at, when you sit in a session and you go, right, how are we going to do, how are we going to look to help, uh, Little Johnny with his resilience. I'm just reflecting as you're talking. Actually. How are we so going to look come to, to mind. I remember I did a session uh, in a school recently. Big John, recently, who's, um, you know, who's, a session with, who's, uh, who's not used some, to passing or kicking, perhaps, doing some, um, with his creativity. Uh, How are we going to best support? The, the staff were watching, uh, and then watching the me work, and then we had a Q&A afterwards so that, just to sort of, uh, you know, the, uh, you know say, why, why do you do this, why do you do that, and all that sort of stuff. And one of the things that came out is that they had this challenge with the expectations, particularly of senior leaders within the school where results were really important and you know seen as being a, a kind of a benchmark for the school in terms of how successful the school was and then its ability to recruit you know future students and this is obviously a, a key driver often and um and i said well what else do you do i mean you know you obviously publish your results you obviously publish the top try scorers you obviously publish the point scorers on all these sorts of things I said, well, what else do you do what else do you prize what else do you share with them and i've got some blank faces and i said well you know, RFU has got cards. Do you ever have prizes for creativity? Do you have prizes for resilience? You know, these sorts of things. And again, you know, your point, like you know, the point you said, it's like they just seen fire for the first time. But, but, but there was immediately this thing of that was amazing. But they were thinking, oh, how are we going to sell this to everyone? And I was like, well, surely that's the easiest sell in the world. Yeah, even though it's on the front page of their website. Well, I, I think it is because my, my son's at school not to get results, but to help him become the best person he can be. Um, and I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I actually think one leads to the other. So I think if you add kids that could do all, if they were creative, if they were self-aware, if they were resilient, if they were good at making things, and they could organise in a school context, they'd probably pass a lot of exams. They'd probably do really well in rugby. They might win some games. Uh, so I don't think they're too mutually exclusive. And it's, you know, and, and we see lots of examples. So um, who do I think? Aidan McNulty at Newcastle Falcons does this. You know, I'm, I'll give some shout-outs to different environments, but does this unbelievably well. Um I would, you know, I'm sure if anyone contacted him, then <laughs> he'd have them in their environment. And I think he does it brilliantly. Uh, Pete Shaw, who's an ex-player who kicked the ball once in a game um, uh, and passed the ball on average eight times a season, has had a, a, an epiphany. He's seen fire. Um, he's at Camford School and they've changed. Yeah, they've looked at their the Camford. And so, they, for example, N is nobility. So when they do the school newsletter, they talk about the kid that's been the most noble. And so I imagine there's children putting jackets in puddles for other kids so they don't get wet when they walk across it because that's what nobility is to me. Um, and, and, and the Brit School and, you know, there's just so much. It's had real traction in school environments. And, and I think you're dead right. It's how do we influence parents? So that's why we've been doing a bit of stuff with Richard Shorter, who's a minister – down in uh, deepest, darkest Essex uh, in Romford and looking at how can we better influence parents because the reality is um, they're the most influential factor in a kid's life. And if you're just dealing with things reactively and putting sticky plasters on them, then you're not going to get there, if I'm honest. So I would have parents on the curriculum. I would support them better. I would support the teachers better in their interactions with them. And I just, you know, and I've seen this happen. So I've, 
Uh, they did it at um, at Newcastle, and so Aidan got all the parents in, and some of the kids were there, and the coaches, and they went, "Cool, here's we're going we're doing cards. We want you to come up with ways you can do cards at home." At so school, just drilling into and some of the aspects of cards, that I think. I mean, we sort of touched on. And they also set the parents' challenge of building a. There's another area build a, a house to protect some eggs often, or something. Um, and um, talked about a lot. And the parents of language used, but I'm not sure people have enough information around how they do it. So I'll be interested and just the parents to practice like, this get is brilliant. And some now, of your so you insights as to the approach you do around doing cards at home. So they're not just looking at the cards. Now, all five of these things are continuously interchangeable, so we don't take them in isolation because it's a bit reductionist. But just looking at how you develop or how you work with you know young players and help them to help them to make decisions, I'd be interested just to get some of your thoughts and insights on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, and you're right, you can't separate them. So awareness leads to decision-making. So in our world, awareness is just information. So what's the stuff you're looking for on the pitch in order to, to inform your decision-making? And clearly, if creativity in our world is about solutions to problems, so if you start taking away solutions, then actually you're going you're gonna to reduce their ability to make decisions. <clears throat> so they are all interlinked. Um, yeah, look, it would be... Uh, Based upon the individual, so um, and 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 it's and it's our context. So the other cool thing for our kids is, well, they play in lots of different environments, so they might make different decisions in different environments based upon the players around them. So uh, lots of stuff around, you know, what's what's Stuart really good at? How can I best support him? So understanding that your decision making isn't reliant upon a system necessarily; it's reliant upon. Uh, People around you and what their strengths are and what their what their weaknesses are. Uh, we play lots of lots and lots of games where they get lots of opportunity to make decisions. They get feedback from the game. So I'm I'm too flat. It's preventing me from passing. If they were struggling to work out, if they were struggling to beat the game, that would be something else that some language we would use. Stolen from Newcastle Falcons. Uh, um, it sounds like we're well, we're sharing a lot of stuff. It's collaborative. Um, then we might just intervene. If we see themes with players, then we would have conversations with them. Um, getting them to observe other players. Um, one of the things we've been doing recently with defences, so I personally think, and this is a hypothesis that I'm testing, that um, labelling defenders around rugs, so guard A, B, or pillar A, B, or whatever it is, limits decision-making. So we're all aware of the guy who who's often got a low number, who runs next to the rug, puts his hand up and breathes a sigh of relief that he doesn't need to make a decision and calls himself guard. Um, and, and people got away with that for generations. However, the reality of the game is it's speeding up. And so your ability to get in there, breathe a sigh of relief and shout guard is is getting limited and, and everyone's looking for you. So, the, so the, the attacker looking for you defensively. So I asked one of our players, if you couldn't run in and say guard, what would you say? And he said, uh, pillar. I said, you can't say pillar. He said, one, can't say one, or any label. He said, um, instead of pointing my hand up and shouting guard, I will point in front of people and tell people what I'm about to do and who I've got. And I was like, well, which piece of information would you prefer? I would prefer that one. So we've taken away, we've stripped out all our calls defensively and just gone, we're just going to talk about what we're going to do. And actually, we're going to be proactive rather than reactive. So we would talk a lot about deception. So there's another way we're changing decision-making. So if you look at uh, defence off a line-out in the backs, often it's the same picture for the attack. And then the attack call a move and the defence react. <laughs> well, what we're doing is going, well, we're going to leave a really big hole for you there. And we're fairly certain you're going to go into it. But we're then going to do this. So we're going to actually play chess. Um, but we're going to force you into a move. So I, I, I'm with you. It's quite um, it's quite hard to separate everything. Uh, we're doing lots of little things, so we're playing around with deception defensively. 
I think uh, people are more comfortable with creativity and deception in attack. I think defensively we're very systems-based. Um, Phil Larder's still getting commission every time someone shouts guard, I hear. Um, and so we're just taking it away and we're just playing around with it and seeing if it leads to, to better outcomes and, and over time if it makes our players better defenders. Well, clearly it does. So the players that are low numbers and and, and put their hands up next to a, a tackle or a ruck as it, it pretty much now is, um, they're not allowed to be within two of a tackle or a ruck in England 18's training. Otherwise, there's a consequence to that. So they actually need to, so we're trying to support their decision-making by putting them in completely different positions and then supporting them because actually that's quite stressful for some of those kids. So I'm always aware that, you know, a potential unintended consequence of of using a constraint or a challenge is, well, this kid's overwhelmed by it. It's like telling the kid in school who's who's currently on an E grade, you need to get an A star in a month's time. He's He's thinking, oh my God, this is impossible. So it's also supporting players through that process because, you know, what, what is a challenge for us and, and also is an um, awesome opportunity. Is it, that, it's interesting. As I said, our kids we, are in lots of environments. We find ourselves come to schools, with, come to academies, you've got these and there's a lot of transition going on. But also, they'll, I've they'll have lots things, and lots of This is where the decision-making piece is interesting for me. In different environments. I think, I think we're trying to simplify For me, anyway, I think there's a real lack of awareness in players. We're coaching through the principles of play. Certainly my experience is a copy of, I see this time and time again, where kids essentially just really, really reactive. I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing. Challenging because that, you know, yeah, they've, they've had a decade of standing next line, to the rope, but not being allowed to kick. They're not pass. really making decisions because um, they aren't been told aware enough to be able to have enough information for them to be able to make a decision. They're um, they're purely and simply just, if you like, being kind of knocked from one defensive. Um, you know, one defender's attempt to try and steal the ball from them from the next. And and if they get through, through by virtue of the fact that they've got some sort of assimilation of techniques that kind of uh, enables them to do so, then brilliant. And, you know, wow, and that's great. But they don't really know kind of why that happened. They probably couldn't replicate it again if 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 they um, if, if they sort of, you know, saw it again. Um, and so that's the one big thing for me around, you know, helping to develop decision making has been this whole focus on uh, raising individual awareness as to, uh, you know, kind of what the problems the game are propo- opposing are, what the problems the defensive op- defenders are proposing, what the problems the attackers are proposing, and sort of dynamically trying to get the players to to, to become aware of some of those things so that they can co you know they can solve them together and solve them individually you know almost at the same time Yeah, and and, and and I would argue that guard AB uh, reduces awareness because people, lots of people will deal in black and white and they'll say, B has to take first receiver. Well, what if first receiver is 20 yards wide? Well, not then. Well, what if first receiver is three yards Well, not then. Well, why? And, and kids will take what we say as adults relatively literally. So it's, it's no surprise to me that lots of nines and tens are making lots of nine, line breaks because – Actually, it's it's relatively flawed. I mean, yeah, and, and and we would have we would play lots of tactical games, and we changed it to beat the game because we we weren't feeling that tactical was resonating with the kids. So it'd be lots of problems, and they would have to find solutions. And then we might talk about how they found the solutions, how they problem solved, and 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 really, it's it's not about us solving problems in huddles led by coaches. It's about players solving problems in the moment. And so it was interesting. Yesterday I was at Harrow School and I really enjoyed this. And uh, and so there were there was a, a three teams and one of the groups was going over and working with the coaches and two of them were playing a game with me. And one of the teams, uh, 
said, yeah, oh, can we go and explain the rules and to the team be, that comes um, on? I said, yeah, of course, Kevin. And they said, and can we tell them the wrong I've always said about I said, being a coach for me has been, so been around the idea of being able to analyse the game. and then being and able then they to solve the problem based on your analytical skills. And actually, that's also really important for the players to be able to do is taking the information and solve the problem. I just thought... What a great I, uh, way to actually give like them lots like of similar, really um, incorrect information have a, to hopefully I'll, I'll work to your rules. advantage. So I'll just say to them, that's uh, a secret rule in this. And then case, see, and, and then watch is. them. And then we, um, I would talk like, to kids example, about when you give them the wrong is, information, what you often get in which is, players do you think um, are going to solve it? Sort of, you know, How quickly do you think they'll solve it? Do you think they'll pass the information on Sometimes that would just purely automatic or purely because they see that that's an obvious kind of opportunity in the future. And they haven't made them aware. They're going to be any, coaches, any other opportunity. Basically. More often than not, they're just putting uh, the ball back into an area of congestion and we want them to explore getting the ball into areas of space. So the secret rule, I call the Elvis rule, no return to sender. Uh, and they have to work it out. They have to work out what that rule is. Now, they've got they've cottoned onto it now, so they've got to come up with some new secret rule. But I do that quite a lot just because I want to see if they can, firstly, work out what the rule is and then, secondly, communicate it to their teammates without the opponents finding out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and and that's I mean and with due respect, if the players are as good at problem solvers as I was, then that's not good enough. So and, and probably the same for you. The reason, you know, we haven't yeah. They just need to be better players than me. And I would be really mindful of who I give information to. So I might give it to one person in, in the middle of the game and say, look, you're not allowed to shout, but you need to get that information out as, as as effectively as you possibly can. I might tell one kid who's really good that your, your goal in the next five minutes is to help the two new kids score tries. But you can't tell them because it's just a different problem then. If we tell everyone there's two new kids and, and Johnny's trying to get tries for them, then... I'm not sure how the two new kids would feel about it, and, and you know, and, and it's a different. It's just a different problem. Um, I talk. So we had a player in the program last year who, who would be pretty um, uh, good defender in terms of he's really quick, so push people to an edge and tackle them. He wasn't really thinking about you know going and hitting people man and ball. He he definitely wasn't thinking intercepts. So an, another classic for coaches is well, intercepts are risky. I'm thinking intercepts are the easiest way to score a try. So I look at Sale at the weekend. They scored three tries of intercepts. They won a game with 34% possession, very little territory. So I'm definitely scoring intercepts. So I say to Ben, to the, the kid Ben, I said, look, um, I just grabbed him on the way to the pitch and say, look, uh, if you get five intercepts in, the, in, in this session, then, uh, then all the coaches will do 20 press-ups. Um, and, and by the way, apparently kids love adults doing press-ups. Um, it's the biggest incentive. And um, and so there's a problem, but no, and I said, and you can't tell anyone. Well, he gets two in two do minutes. You, um, I mean, so I then where, need where to tell everyone on, because it's on, actually on too the, easy. The, I, so I then say, I look, see Ben's trying to get this. Uh, and if he gets them, where, all of For example, apparently the whiteboard on so the side I'm, I'm of the pitch is training is the thing thing to do now. Uh, great because, big... Great you know, big it's a bit like chart. the English lug it out there and then it's basically like you've this. basically well, written out everything that's going to be done in the session. Everyone. Uh, or well, no one uh, you're me. explicit at the start with, and, the, with the group of players. The, re- the reason them, it's right, this is the session, this is what we're working on, these are the themes. Because no one told England. Um, I'm Whereas if everyone had told England, I want them then it would have been by fine. End, we could tell have me, what, is, have gone, what, what is it we were working on today? But then we wouldn't have the theory. It's an interesting test because if the... Game and the same when I ask the, ex-players, um, you know, you know, did you ever uh, I've done. do training sessions if they work in the way I'm coaching and they draw, and they draw and awareness that I'm looking to draw, the problem on the bench and the, sh- the players it's a should be able to tell me so what it need is to train more that like the, you know, the, kind of the, the theme that they were working on because it should, it should have, they should have sort of twigged onto it. Obviously, there's going to be some questioning and things going on through that session. But I don't, I don't know how I feel about being explicit at the start about what the session is about.
<laughs> I'm rarely explicit. However, what we would say to I would want I would want the players to have some input into what the session might look like. However, especially if you go into so I dropped into Harrow yesterday. Well, the the sessions based upon the needs of the players. So I rock up and actually don't know what their needs are. So let's let's start off and, and see where we end up. Uh, we've been using whiteboards, but so I went to Teddy's Oxford the other day and the kids were um, getting to groups of three or four. Talk about what your super strength with similar super strengths. Set yourselves a challenge. Uh, and so, for example, uh, four of the guys were first one to get three kick to scores and five fix the ball. Um, got a, a school lunch served to him by the other three. Um, so just to create games within games, so I would use it for that, and I would give them ownership of that. It's also quite interesting. You know, it's easier in the England environment because most of those players have got individual development plans, and they would know what are they trying to get better at. And for me, an individual development plan should be put into a session. And so there's a really good way of, of using a, a whiteboard that you've lugged out. Um, I w- we would rarely be that ex- explicit around what the session looks like. Although if a kid came up to us beforehand and said, look, what's in the session? Because this is what I'm looking to work on. Then we would definitely share that information. And that would be, we would expect, you know, a lot of our players would do that pre-session anyway, come up and go, look, uh, what's the focus of the session? Cool, I'm trying to do this. And um, and we would, I'm always mindful. I mean, if you call a session a defence session, then at, at, attack don't really try and score. Uh, everyone focuses on the defence or attack score and then they get told off by the defence coach. Um, so Or the defence coach has 15 defenders against 10 attackers because we just want success. Um, so or if you call a session a team run, it basically just becomes a, unopposed, you know, session that's nothing like the game. So it's really not a team run, if I'm honest, because it's nothing like the game. Um, so I would be, yeah, I'd be mindful about what I call a session. But, yeah, we would we would be the same as you. I would be relatively comfortable that we're going to run some kind of game activity, and if we feel like we need to, to, to pull people out, we might do that. However, I'm thinking that we're all playing this game, but within the game, everyone's, individually playing a different game. So Brilliant. Stuart might I mean, be really good at kicking off his right foot. Well, Stuart's getting double points if he kicks to score off his left foot. Games. I mean, what, and Stuart might be really be good at, uh, at getting intercepts. So Stuart's challenge is to make freedom. four of the players get intercepts. And I, and I so I'm using you as a coach. I think I'm not saying Stuart's going to get four intercepts. I'm saying Stuart's challenge is to get four other players to be as good as him And actually, funnily enough, So whilst we're playing a game, everyone's... That you can bring to your coaching, and, um, because and that's, uh, you know, again, you know, you, I think easy, you have to use so your, often, uh, you know, your, your Google your Meta card, because you have to be a so Teddy the other day. That well, an easy way for me to do, do that is to, is to put a white on the picture and go, lads, that you were set yourself some Therefore, challenges and I can have a look you know, at them and go, you okay, then cool, why do you pick that? And then you what probably you find something that? better is there because of the adaptation and then you've got something oh, else that you well, can then do. Well, this group are trying to do this, I'm going to tell the rest of the group that's trying to do it because your job is to try and stop them. And we're just creating lots of Particularly in the early stages of their coaching career because, you know, it's like, well, I kind of – I don't know what I don't know. I, I, I've got too much. There's too many things I can do. You know, it's almost like going back to your point about the, you know, the, the, the kid who's on an E asking for an A because it's a bit of overwhelm. So if you were speaking to somebody who was at the start of their coaching journey, and it's quite a lot of people who do tune into this who are at the start of their coaching journey, what advice would you give them in terms of taking their first steps to working in this way, you know, ripping up the recipe cards and actually starting to work in a, in a much more method approach um, a bit more experimental. You're obviously going to have some bad food, but you know you're going to get some really good stuff out of it as well. So, how would you guide somebody in that space?
Uh, I would get them on the Magic Academy with immediate effect. Um, I think getting learning from people around you, it can often feel quite an isolated job being a coach. Uh, one of the things that the biggest feedback we get from, from Magic is that I thought I was the only person who's having these problems and, and trying this stuff and, and getting this kind of stuff from my senior leaders. And so they, they feel a certain sense of, of, of relatedness and belonging. Um, yeah. I, and, and I would go and observe other people. I would go and learn off them. I would, there's, there's, there are resources out there. There's some pretty, you know, there's, there's a wealth of resources. I would, I would listen to your podcasts. I would, you know, follow some influential people on Twitter. Uh, I would just go out there and try. I would, I would bring the kids into the process as well. And I would involve the parents just because, um, if you don't, you, you can often feel them against you. Um, even, you know, at Old so the, under 14s, well, uh, informing the kids. The reason I asked and, the question and, and is Influencing because, the parents and talking about, well, um, I think there's it's going to look like this. Um, so, for example, and this you know, has, has, has really helped, even for me. It was, work. Um, it, was, it was a little bit stressful to start with. I think. Um, and just go and coach. If someone, just go somebody get in lots of different environments, coach different ages, work. coach different they sexes, coach it's different it's abilities, um, coach different sports. They think, because they're expecting uh, to see. Because it's tough. Because if you're a Sunday morning dad order, and coach, um, you know, say it's, you know, say there's another couple some, of coaches, um, you maybe get half an hour a week. Well, isolated practice over a year. That's, that's not a what huge a amount common time conception of what coaching so, is. You know, ha- your approach without that deliberate uh, or, you know, practice, approach, how do you get better? I would, um, feel I would reflect. I would go. Well, how do we do that better? I would ask players what was your best bit. How hard did you find that? How could I do it better? I would be willing to be vulnerable and learn. Individuals going on. So from an observer's perspective, it's not going to happen overnight. Coaching. So. Uh, why would you think- how do you navigate that because i think some people particularly when they're new into this they sort of can't find the the balance point i, I see a lot of coaching um uh, on a regular basis you know at my club and everywhere else where what we've got now is <clears throat> these kids playing games and that's it that's it they just play a game a small-sided game yes maybe a game with some rules attached but they just play a game and I don't think it's that rich with learning because it isn't it hasn't got all the other layers that you've thrown into this. So how do you navigate that's probably two questions in one, but how do you navigate all that? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's yeah, I, I, and what I would say is, um, lots of the best players in the world just play games with their mates for long periods of time, and it definitely had some impact. However, I agree, it could be significantly richer. Uh, I'm, I'm possibly how we deliver our coach development reflects that more now, so it would be much more around. So, for example, I'm going to one on Sunday and I'm going to do some stuff with some coaches and they're going to send me their, their session plan, so to say. We're going to have some questions. We're going to bounce it around. I'm going to say, well, look, at, you know, how can I best support you? Is that on the pitch setting challenges? Is that off the – what is it? And we're doing much more of that collaboratively and we're getting the people to coach and we're working alongside them. Um and then we'll reflect on it. And it's, you know, we're not going to change the world. And by the way, I'm still learning how to coach. So I'm not, by no way am I saying I'm the finished article. However, I do want to be the best coach in the world. I mean, I, I definitely don't see any point doing it if I, if I wouldn't want to be that. And then by that, I mean coach of coaches and coach of of, of players. Um, we're, we're probably a bit more informal. 
So we just had a lot of guys up in the uh, England 18s camp and they're, they're asking questions there on the pitch with, you know, we're grabbing coffees. We're talking about what does it mean in your context? We're trying to go into other people's context. So last year with Gloucester, we, we had a coach development session and one guy puts his hand up and he goes, look, this wouldn't work in my club. It's completely different. We were like, brilliant. Let's go in your club in a month and let's go do this. So he sent me his session plan. We then talked about, well, have you thought about this is the better way of doing this? And we just, we just iterate and we talk I mean, about, well, why would you um, make a decision like that? Why would you do this? That's a great place for us you know, why to draw the this? We talk a lot about the, the conversation. The I mean, I know we could, and we could talk and for hours about this and, um, um, and, and I'm, you I know, I'm really, really enjoy the conversation. The time is absolutely flowed by. Of people um, who are doing but, brilliant um, stuff. There's, and uh, they are that, that's, there's loads in there that so I think the stuff uh, with the ACDOs, people should be able to take away. One of those I think people might have to listen um, to a couple of times. I'm certainly example, be listening back to it myself. At, uh, hate to, hate to listen 18, to my own voice, but certainly Bedford you've Modern been School, dropping Brett Richard, knowledge bomb after knowledge cool bomb. Just knowledge cluster bombs, I reckon I'm going to call them. A Magic Academy meet at Bedford School. So, hey, how can people – you mentioned the Magic Academy. That's on Edubai, isn't it? Yeah, what are the needs? What are your problems? And let's let's look at some solutions. Uh, and that much more informal stuff rather than there's a, there's a curriculum. Um, and there's, um, and there's these competencies that you have to be able to tick off, just helping coaches on a much more individual level. And yeah, it's, it's definitely hard, you know, harder, but we're, I, I real, I, I really feel like we're having huge impact. Yeah, strong. I'm enjoying that. Fantastic. I like the idea of coaching as being, uh, uh, you know, kind of creating some spells yeah, so for, what, um, and to see I how we can we bewitch these young probably, players and help uh, them develop the, the process the right that, that concept is what I'm going to be... Uh, we needed an informal that. sharing space for coaches. So where they could feel connected, where they could um, engage with other coaches from, you know, there's, there's premiership coaches, there's international coaches, there's top 14 coaches... There's Sunday morning dads and mums, there's psychologists, there's people from other sports. So we've now got 1,300 coaches. It's completely free. Um, people will go on there, they'll interact, they'll go, oh, can I come and have a look at that in your environment? And it just leads to much more collaboration and sharing. And, you know, there's this, that's why I talk about this, this surge of people who are actually doing some, some brilliant stuff. Uh, and I'm learning loads off them. So, you know, I, I definitely can't claim all the knowledge cluster bombs I've just dropped. Um, some of them are definitely from awesome. other people. I've got an idea for so you. You might be way ahead of me, me on this, but I reckon the person who C-double-L makes sort of the most sure. valuable contributions in the Magic Academy is a wizard. There you, 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 you go. You're a wizard. You get to uh, <laughs> you get to go weave some spells. <laughs> I mean, look, we need to inspire awesome kids. We need, right. um, we need them to fall in love with sports. Amazing. And, and Thank you very much for all the reasons time. we fell in love with sports. I'm glad we could get this conversation and, done. And we need and, to think um, of I think being like be, the people that loads in that. inspired us. I'm the pretty most. certain we're so going to get a lot, you, a lot of questions. You know, it may well be we have to do a part two if you're going to be able to One or two coaches that, or adults or teachers or mentors or whoever it is that believed in them or changed their life or showed them what was possible. And that's how I think coaches should should see the world uh, and, and and genuinely there's some super inspirational p- coaches out there who are doing stuff way better than I could ever imagine and you know and and genuinely changing people's lives and you know that's the cool stuff <laughs> there's actually a guy uh, in the Magic Academy whose name is Merlin, and that's his, and that's his real name. So Merlin O'Donnell, I thought, I thought he changed his name so he could, you know, get into them. But yeah, so uh, 
Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll uh, I'll bear that one in mind. Yeah, awesome. I'll just have to get through my 1,600 emails per month and uh, we'll be fine with that one. Cheers, mate. Bye.